bring some more chairs in. Y'all can come. Um, tonight, I want to I walk through some passages of Scripture. And uh, um, actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a good bit of Scripture. And here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read through about, well, I'm not going to tell you how many verses of Scripture because then you'll, then you'll automatically tune me out because it's 20 verses of Scripture. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's more than 20 because there's several, 20 references. And here's what I'm asking, I want to ask you to do. I want you to listen as I read it and uh, see if you can find a common thread uh, between the scriptures. And uh, uh, some of, most of them will have, there may be some that it might be a stretch to find that commonality, but you, I think you'll catch it. I hope you will. If you're not, then I have failed miserably. But uh, this, is, this is up to God, not up to me. So let me pray first. That would probably be a good start. Father, we just come and take these moments. And Lord, we want you to speak to us. We want to hear from you, Father. We want to hear your word and hear your voice. And God, I know in my heart, Lord, that as we look at these scripture references, as we look at the, what your word has to tell us, that God, the uniqueness of your word is that it can speak individually to each need that's in this room, no matter what it is. And God, you can uh, address needs that, uh, that, that need to be addressed, and you can give answers that need to be given. So Lord, help us to tune our ears and our heart to you, to hear and then to be willing to respond to what you have to say. So God, take this time and use it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, and how I stumbled across this is, is, is uh, because we are in the midst of the Christmas season and uh, in preparation for the message this morning. And, and uh, I had, there was one other passage of scripture that I had looked at in the book of Isaiah. This morning we looked at Isaiah 9 and 6. And there's a passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that uh, just a phrase within the, the verse just kind of captured my heart. And uh, I've been dwelling on it for days. And, and the more I dwelled on it, the more God opened up some other verses that uh, I, I think that uh, we, can, we can draw some commonalities to. This, uh, Isaiah 7, 14 says this. It says, she will give birth birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. That's amazing to stop and think about. You know, we, I asked, we, we, it's all tying together now that I think about it, the song that we sang, the wonder of it all, to think that God loves me. And I ask you, you know, to think about what is it that maintains your wonder and sense of awe in the fact that God does love you. And some of us shared and some of us thought about it and some of us wondered, you know, maybe some of us are sitting here and thinking, does he really love me? Does he really love me? Well, he loved you enough that, enough that uh, he took a prophet 700 years ago that made this proclamation that... Uh, it states, she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And that's a direct reference to who? Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God with us. Now, when you, I started thinking about that, those three words, God with us. Then I personalize it because I can take the us part and, and, and look at God off in the distance. And I wanted to, God is with me. And I wanted to draw that in and draw myself in to where I stopped and gave reason to stop and wonder. You know, what does that mean, God with me? Now, I want to read some other verses of Scripture, and I want to see if we can connect all these dots. It says, uh, Zephaniah 3.17. It says, The Lord 
your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. What does that tell you about this God with us? Well, it tells me that... uh, (laughs) It reminds me that he he loves me enough that he wants to sing over me. And he wants to sing over you. He wants to exalt over you with loud singing. It says that he rejoices over you with gladness. But at the very beginning, the very opening statement says, the Lord your God is what? In your midst according to this translation that I've got. In your midst. How does that connect to Emmanuel? God with us. Same thing. Job chapter 23, verse 10 says, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. God with us also implies that God knows us. And he says, Job says, He knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. You all know the story of of Job. He held true, held faithful to God, even in the midst of all that life brought his way. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you. He's with you wherever you go. So the prophecy that Isaiah foretold in Isaiah 7.14 and it being fulfilled as it was declared in Matthew 1.23, you know, it even predates Isaiah in the sense that that God is with you wherever you go. Well, we've got to draw that correlation between that God and Jesus, or God is, Jesus is God. And that we have that promise in Scripture that Jesus says in Matthew 28, uh, 28, 18, through 20. He says, I am with you. I will be with you wherever you go. The fulfillment of all of that. It says um, <laughs> Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Have, have you, are you, are you, is the thread coming through? Can you see? He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now think about it. There's nothing that the world can bring at you that can bring your way that would keep God from you. And we'll get to the pa- a passage that declares that in just a minute. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not, I am with you. Do not be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Genesis 50 20 says, You intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Jeremiah 29 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And that hope and a future means the presence of God is with you. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. Over and over and over again, we see it in Scripture that God goes with us. God is with us. It says, Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Does that, do you understand that when God says He's with you, that when God is with you, everything that encompasses who God is and what God does comes with the package. Protection, security, safety, provision. It says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There it is. There's nothing. There's nothing that when God is with you, there's nothing that can, <laughs> that can separate you from that. And we see the other for, more fulfillment of the prophecy. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen His glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 through 114, Judges 6 12 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Over and over again, Isaiah 46 4 says, Even to your old age and gray hairs. Did you hear that, Terry? Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am He. I am He who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. All predicated on God, known as Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. Psalm 91, 1 and 2 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Just as we spoke about this morning, Jesus made the provision he and the Father made the provision. John 14 says, I'll ask the Father and He'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. He, you know Him, for He dwells with you. With you. And will be in you. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. He knew. That's great. God is here. Scripture says it. And I already quoted Matthew 28, 20, that he says, I'm surely, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, come back, those scriptures I just read, the passages I shared with you, what's the common thread? God is with us. God fulfilled the promise that Isaiah spoke of. He will be called Emmanuel. And it's been fulfilled and it continues to be fulfilled even in this place with 35 people. We only needed three, but I'm glad there's 35. God fulfilled the promise. I think it's, to me, when I look at the, all the scripture that talks about God with us in the scriptures that I read, that I, the common thread is, is what I would refer to as as the positional relationship with God. He's here. He's with me wherever I go. He is, he, <laughs> I got the quiz in Terry about, uh, earlier about 
prepositions. And I'm not sure either one of us came out right with it, but I, 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 she, she Googled it, and she, she does really well with Google. And, uh, and the word with, you know, uh, it, it can be used as a preposition. Uh, Deborah, you're an English teacher, right? Uh, that's one of them. Can I tell you there's another preposition that we find in Scripture about this positional relationship with God, and uh, it's Christ in you. In is another preposition. Positional relationship. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So here's what I'm, I'm trying to get to. I, I want us to look just real briefly, just, just for a few more moments, at four different positional statements in Scripture of that positional relationship with God. We, the first one we've already looked at is God with us. In Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we looked at Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God with you. That's the first one that we've talked about. Christ in you. Crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In me. He's in me. That's how close that positional relationship is. He is in us. And to uh, Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. This is the mystery which is, is, is uh, of His glory among the Gentiles is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we have God with us. We have Christ in us. And uh, then we have the third, I wouldn't call it necessarily positional relationship, but it is definitely connected to the relationship is God is for us. God is for us. Not only is with us, he's in us, but he's for us. <laughs> Romans 8, 31. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Romans 8. I love that passage of Scripture. I read parts of it a while ago. Romans 8.31 makes this statement. It says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Who, if ever, can be against us? And then it goes on, if you look down in, in verse 35, chapter 8, it says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if, we're, if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the Scripture says, for your sake we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No! Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And here's the, here's the, here's the kicker. He says, And I am convinced... I hope you're convinced. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now doesn't that sound like a God who is for you? If He is for, He is with you, He is in you, and He is for you, and He has provided the fact that there's nothing that this world can bring against you that will separate you and cause Him to love you any less than He does right now. I don't know about you, that's just, that stirs up my wonder and my awe. That's, that's incredible to stop and think about. 
But you know, God has designed that with a purpose for us because it's not just God with you and God in you, Christ in you, and it's not just God for you, but there's another element of this is there's God through you. God through you. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It says there's one body and one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You all. Almost a y'all in the scripture. Through us, God, through you. Now, what I believe that means is that when God is with you and God is in you and God is for you and God is through you, that through you element is that means that God is going to use you as his instrument to further his kingdom. And that means that he's going to permeate your being. Anybody bake bread? Have baked bread, maybe. All right. You've watched somebody. You've seen a video. Anybody eating bread? There you go. You can't live on bread alone. alone. Got to have some meat and potatoes, right? It's it, there's 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 a. There's a passage of scripture that is referred to as it's a parable, actually. Jesus, it's a parable that is contained in two sentences. And uh, it's one of those parables until I got to looking at the, this, the positional relationship of Christ with us and what it means that God is with me and what it means that God is in me and what it means that God is for me and what it means that God is through me that I... I it kind of shed a little bit of light on this particular parable that I didn't understand before. And it's, it, it, it's probably me, it's, and it, you probably it made the connection right off, but this is called the parable of yeast, or the parable of leaven. And it's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, and it's one verse of Scripture, it's verse 33, and this is what he says. He used this as an illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. When I've read this before, all I could do is imagine what fresh bread smelled like, and it made me hungry. I didn't really concentrate on what it really meant and got to thinking about it. And the, but when you, you, you come back and you put into perspective, what does it mean by the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? The kingdom of heaven, oftentimes we equate it, we think it is, is in the heavenly realms, but the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of God is his rule and reign over all of his creation. And guess what? You and I are part of that creation. And so the kingdom of heaven is within us as long as we allow him to rule and reign. And it says that it's, it's like this. It's like yeast and bread. Now, I, I've, I've tried years ago, we had one of those little bread baking machines that you or you dump it all in and it came out rock hard you know it was just like Terry's first biscuits yeah she'll admit to it they were bad that was back in the dark ages um, anyway I'm getting off, off the track but anyway I have, I have tried to bake bread with yeast before or rolls I, you know yeast rolls you know, I can think of uh, go to O'Charlie's or go down to uh, uh, the Elite, the Elite Elite restaurant. And the, those yeast rolls, I can just eat them. Just keep eating them and eating them, eating them. Tasty, tasty, tasty. But I've watched it. It, it. it a small package of yeast. You take it and drop it in warm water, right, to activate it. Is for those who are bakers. Is that right? 
I've read those instructions before. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> I don't read instructions. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. I, I read those instructions. You warm, warm water, drop the yeast in it, activates the yeast, and then you, you take it and you knead it in the dough that you've created with the flour and the water and, or whatever liquid that is, is taking it. And, and, and the more you knead it, then, then you've got to let it rest, right? And, and you, uh, I remember my grandmother would take a towel and put it over the big mixing bowl. And you'd, you'd, you could sit there and watch it. After a little while, you see that towel start moving. That yeast does its work because it permeates. There's not a part of the dough that is not affected. And it doesn't take but just a little bit to make an impact and to make something good and to make something that tastes wonderful. God with us, God in us, God for us, and God through us is the yeast of living out a life for God, allowing Him to rule and reign in the kingdom of heaven that He's creating within you. It permeates your soul. It impacts every aspect of your life. And I'm telling you tonight, that's something worth wondering about. Thank you, Lord God, for the truth of your presence with us. A promise made hundreds of years ago that is more true, as true today as it was then. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord God, for being God with us, God in us, God for us, and God through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stay in and we'll sing 220. Yeah. 